Good morning. Good to be with you. We uh, just got off the plane last night, actually, from a great trip. Pastor Schaller went to India and then Oman. I went to Baku and then stopped in Dubai and went also to Oman. We had an amazing time. Just uh, the thought that came across my mind is how healthy it is for me, uh, how good it is for my familiarity to get on a plane and go to a foreign country, to get in a car and drive to some remote village four hours away, eat strange food, love people, how good it is for my flesh, how my mind settles, how the important things become alive to me, um, how I stop thinking about myself. Uh, and uh, this is maybe why I love it so much. It just kind of fixes me. And people thank you and all this stuff, but, uh, you know, I'm just there to, you know, find more of God. And uh, we just had such an awesome time. We, uh, we, we just felt blessed to be with Pastor Mati, and some of the Finns were also there, and uh, just the beautiful beginnings of a, wor of a work going on there. And the beautiful people of Oman, and uh, just such a pleasure to be there. Uh, one of the thoughts I was meditating on kind of all week was based on Ephesians uh, chapter 3, just for a quick introduction. And this thought I think about often, uh, about the love of God, specifically the incomprehensible love of God. In uh, verse 18, as we all know this verse so well, of Ephesians chapter 3, it says that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height of the love of God, and to know the love of Christ, in verse 19, which passes knowledge. This is an invitation, like, in these words, our tremendous potential. God is speaking of something incomprehensible to a, to a human mind. That me on my own, with all my intelligence or lack of it, with all my experience or lack of it, doesn't really matter. We're talking about something different. A great, big, gigantic love that I cannot see, I cannot comprehend. And my thought was, Lord, I, you obviously desire for me to know this. And how do I know it? Are you showing it to me? And I had just thoughts throughout the week about that. And just trying to rehearse those thoughts. How do I know God's love? How do I know it to be different? How do I know it to be so big? And of course, our greatest example is the mere concept of the Trinity. That is something that is beyond my comprehension. There is love between God and the Son. I love my wife, and I think about my wife, and there are thoughts towards my wife all the time, and I love her with those thoughts, but actually my thoughts are interrupted. I am a sinner, and I have selfishness, and my love is not constant. Sometimes I have selfish thoughts that limit my love towards my wife. And the very idea that there are two or three individuals that have thoughts towards each other endlessly, nonstop, all the time, every day, every hour, all the time, loving each other without any interruption is proof for me that this love is huge, that this love is incomprehensible that there is something so big out there, so immense in size, well, wider than the earth, higher than heaven, lo lower than hell, uh, longer than eternity, from eternity to eternity, God loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, uninterrupted. That's just beautiful. Another thought is the, uh, the idea of our individuality. Um, evolution has no need for individuality. In fact, you could argue, I think, 
that once evolution could, would find a pattern or a system that works, that it would duplicate it exactly the same way to produce success. But for some reason, there are seven billion people on this earth and every single one of us is different. You could take any one of you and put them on stage and describe, describe this person in a shocking way as being extremely individual. And if there's someone on the other side of the earth that looks like us, it is shocking. On the outside, they look like us, but on the inside, they're totally different. From our eyeballs to our fingerprints to our personality, we are, every single one of us, shockingly individual. But why? Why is there a need for this? And the answer is love, this big, huge love. Because my wife loves me, and she loves everything about me, I say that in faith. <laughs> but what if there was just one other person like me, exactly like me? What if there was a person that lived in Washington, D.C., just like me, God forbid, and exactly the same fingerprints, eyeballs, personality? It would water down my wife's love for me. She could love me, but she might as well love that person because he is the same as me. And that love then becomes less. So God made us individuals perfectly, ex extraordinarily, so unique, so one. And, uh, and it's because of love. So he could express individual love to us. And these thoughts are just big, incomprehensible, but we get a taste of it. We, we know it. And then maybe the last thing is just our free, our free will. Pastor Shell has been talking about that a little bit here and there, and just that God would give up his own will and give it to us and say, you can decide, and you can go against me if you want, and you can influence me if you want, and you can make decisions on your own. And actually, I'm going to pay a big price for your, your free will. And if you took all the evil in this world, in the history of this world, and placed it on one side, on one scale. If you took all the murder and all the horrible things that go on on any given day, and so many people struggle with this, but if you added it all up and put it on one side, if you took, for example, from 1935 to 1955, 80 million people were murdered by Stalin and Hitler and Japan. You took all of that and put it on one side, and then you put the love of God on the other side. It would tip the scale. It would show us that it's not only healing, not only redeeming, not only amazing, but that you could use the word justify, that his love is so immense that you could justify the existence of evil. And that's a scary word, and maybe not to be talked about quickly like this, but I'm just trying to, you know, paint a big picture of this amazing love. And I think God loves us. And that's why we love him. And I don't know how God ministers to us. Yeah, sometimes I don't know how this comes through, but I am convinced that uh, this is what changes me. God said he would make me a fisherman of men, but he would make us fishermen this way by showing us his love. And once we grasp it, once we get a rhema about his love, that we would become soul winners. And once we operate or have a glimpse of his love, we start to operate in the body this way, that we start to love people with this, this love. And, and in 1 Corinthians, it, it so clearly says that everything we do, everything we do, all the energy of the flesh, everything that man has accomplished, all of it, put it all on one side, 6,000 years of accomplishments, it, it means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing without this great, great, grand, big, huge love. That's the weight of it. And God said in First John 3, he said, Behold, behold, we can see it. Fix my eyes to see your love, God. Help me to see your love that we will be beholding for eternity. And that's, that's a beautiful thing, amen?
Thanks, Pastor P. Wow. Love. Good word. Yeah, Pastor, thank you. Good morning. Thanks, sir, your prayers and your life of faith. I, Pastor Pete and I were, as he said, we were together in Oman. I have a map up on the screen because I always, when I go away, I like to share with you a little bit of where it was and a little bit about what happened. Uh, uh, so we have the map. Yeah, there we do. We we went here to India, <coughs> to excuse me, Bombay, India, and we had a a nationwide or really regional uh, co convention. Uh, people came from Nepal here, Kathmandu, uh, Delhi, um, Rajasthan, Gujarat, uh, southern India, Orissa. Um, you know, num many uh, uh, parts of India, there's, I think, 121 greater, ch greater Grace churches in India, and we uh, meet every year here or in Bangalore, <clears throat> India. We hear stories when we are there, and I want to share a little bit about that with you. Uh, and then uh, we uh, flew... Um, to Oman, this is this country here. We are on the north shore there on the Persia, the uh, Gulf. And um, we're with Pastor Mati and a small team, and we had uh, four days together. And there I want to share a little bit about that with you as well. And then yesterday we, we flew uh, eight hours to London, and then uh, another eight hours here to uh, Baltimore. <clears throat> Uh, thanks for your prayers, thanks for your love, and your lives of faith. I want to share a little bit about love this morning, and then uh, the life of faith. So two portions, Ephesians chapter 3, this is what Pastor Pete was sharing regarding love. Uh, we, we have uh, on, the, on the side, I, I, just to mention that we have our greater, we call it Greater Grace Expo, is happening next Sunday morning, and this will be a little bit of a, a more, um, we will have a message, but we'll also have the opportunity to go down the sidewalk to the family center, and we'll have some booths there, and, um, and just a time where you can go and get a little bit of an idea more what we do in our church in order to reach the lost, build our communities, and serve in our church here. So if you'd like to get a little more involved, then next Sunday morning you'll have that opportunity to learn a little more. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse... 19. <clears throat> Let's look at, uh, this is a prayer, chapter 3, verse 14, it begins, Paul's prayer. There are three important prayers in the book of Ephesians, this is one of them. And it basically, and just, just to give you the general prayer, that we would know in our inner man God's love. That deep in our spirit, that we would know the nature of God and his love. The spirit of God in us, that we would comprehend, this is verse 18, that be, we would be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. Now, usually in the Bible, when we have those words, breadth, length, and depth, and height, we have numbers connected with those words. The ark was this long. The ark was this tall. The ark was that wide. The tabernacle of Moses was this long that wide, and so on. The 
Temple of Solomon. But here we have no numbers because this is spiritual. The second floor of the house. The infinity of God, the nature of God, the spirit of God, beyond the numbers of man. Now, two stories. As many of you know, Pastor Carl and Sue in Bombay, uh, and he's been pastoring there, a graduate of our school here. And they, they, we were in their home with them. We went from the airport right to their apartment. Uh, Justin, my son, was with me, which is another story I want to share with you a little bit. And also congratulations to the high school soccer team that won the championship last night. <clears throat> it's amazing. Our parents and the price they pay, the raising children and teaching them in the faith, I don't think there could be anything greater in our lives than to have our children with us in the faith. To have a relationship with the very people that we love so much. Pastor Pete mentioned his wife. Pastor Carl and Susie are facing an amazing challenge, humanly speaking. If you talk to a medical person or you you look and investigate this particular challenge that they have as people, it is very easy to be discouraged. But sitting with them and being with them and listening to them and being in their home and realizing this verse, 18, that we are able to comprehend that we are actually in the presence of people that are living in dimensions that are beyond the human measurement of life, which is so common. Verse 19, And to know the love of God, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Uh, scientific knowledge social knowledge, cultural knowledge, uh, the statistics of things, that men cannot walk on water, that nobody could be healed today. Well, we are believing for Pastor Carl's healing. And, and we are serious, as he and his wife are serious about it, in the spirit, in the life of faith, when we were in India, Pastor Atul told me the story that I would meet a man in the conference who had brain cancer. He was in a hospital. He had had some surgery for the brain tumor. And they succeeded in a degree. Then it, it came back. The doctors basically said there was nothing they could do for him. He would die in two weeks. Our people who went there and were visiting him did not know him. He was a stranger. But they were compelled by love. They went to see him and they prayed for him. And even his family had forsaken him. Everybody had left him except these dear Christian people who just kept going back by love. Well, the man walked out of the hospital was at the conference, totally healed. I'm guessing 26 years old. But the story goes on. That man is so on fire for God. That man cannot believe that he has been healed so clearly by Christ. That man is the Holy Spirit in his heart, and he has love. So they go, he has gotten a group of people in the church to go to a tuberculosis hospital. It's the largest hospital of its kind in the world. I, if, I, if I remember correctly, there are 10,000 patients in it. Many of them are left and forsaken by family and friends. 
The reason, because in Hinduism, if you have tuberculosis, they generally think it is a curse on your life, and they disown you, or they detach themselves from you. They, they don't have hope for you. They think there is something that you must have done to have gotten this sickness. So this man who's been healed of the brain tumor has a team, and they go to the hospital. Now, generally, in a tuber tuberculosis hospital, you would wear a mask. And he said, we cannot minister to the people covering our faces. Let's just go and minister to them. God will protect us, and we will have a ministry to these people. They go back. Sometimes the people are gone. They've died in a week's time. These are serious cases. And then I met a girl the last night I was there who had come out of the hospital, had been forsaken, but now she had found this new family, the church. And she was sitting in the meeting there, and they introduced me to her. And I realized that this woman has a whole new life. Because there is a love that is beyond knowledge. There is a love that does not give up. There is a love that cares. Verse 19 says, to know the love of Christ. This is what we want to see. And to see it in our church here now, and have seen it through the decades with people, maybe not always in such an extraordinary or dramatic context, but in day-to-day -day living. And I mentioned caring for our children because there is a battle for our children, a battle for the faith, a battle for our very lives. And I believe there are many people that don't know how to fight that battle. That's what I want to share for our second part. And this is Jeremiah chapter 17. <clears throat> what a fun time our trip was. It was extraordinary. We were, we were sitting one night in the cafe, a group of us. We had about six Omani young men, you know, the turbans and the whole, you know, the white gown called a dish dash. Um, and these young guys, very polite, very hospitable, very open very kind of, uh, just kind of like, you can talk to them, and, and we just had a very good time with them at that table for an hour. And I asked them questions like, are you married? How do you find a wife? How much money do you make in a month? How many hours a week do you work? Um, what's your favorite food? All of the, do you, have you ever ridden a camel? Uh, what are your families like? If you get married to one wife, do you think you would have another one? What's the maximum number of wives you can have? Is that a good thing? There's, the answer is four. And, the, uh, and we had a talk, a very fascinating time of exchange. People are the same everywhere in the world. And we, got our, we had really a lot of good fun with them and communicating with them. Love in our hearts. Love, caring about people. Uh, one day in Oman, we went to the countryside, and all we did was go to the village, go to an area. It didn't even look like a village, or just a street. And we just got out of the car, and we stood in the street. And then people, a man from that house comes out, and and asks us, you know, can we help, can I help you? And anyway, to make a long story short, we end up in a house, 
sitting on the floor drinking tea, and the man was a camel farmer. And he said, after some talk, do you want to see my camels? We said, how far away? He said, three kilometers. Sure. We pile in a pickup truck. We have a car. His kids jump in. I'm riding the pickup truck with this camel farmer. And we went to see his milk camels. There were about a hundred of them, he said. And then he had racing camels at another place. Very kind, very open, very interesting, very real people like you and I. And there is something that you and I have, that you and I have found, that has changed our lives. What is the basis of our worldwide ministry? What is it based on? What is our personal life? based upon? What do we teach our children? What makes us different? Is it our money, our education, our upbringing, our personal ability, our strengths, our cleverness? Uh, what is it that your life is based upon? Well, here it is, Jeremiah 17, 5 to I think we'll read, we might make it to verse 9, but we'll start with verse 5. <clears throat> Let's say it the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and make his flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Another way of saying this verse, cursed is the man that trusts in himself, trusts in external things. You know how many times we trust in uh, things that are outside of us, like in politics, if we have enough money, we can educate everybody. And if we have enough money, we will give welfare and support for every needy person. There'll be no more poverty. If we have enough this, then we'll be blessed. But actually, this is not saying that. It's saying that we'll be cursed if we trust in the external things that are around about us. Maybe somebody trusts in their good looks. Maybe their high scores in an academic field. Maybe in their money. Maybe in winning the lottery. That's it. If I win the lottery, I'll be blessed. How about if my camels are the best camels? We asked him, what is the price of his best camel? He said, he gave, we did a calculation, $350,000. This guy was not a small potato. Camel guy. I said, did you get it from your dad? He said, yeah, I learned about camels from my dad. And I said, is it going to go to your children? He said, yeah, they're going to be camel, camel people. Of course. But if I have my trust in camels, money, education, the program, this is not a blessing. It's actually a curse. Really, you may not believe me this morning, but I want you to take it and tuck it in your heart and think about it. Maybe it'll become clear to you by the time we're finished speaking. I don't think all of you trust me or believe me on this point in verse 5. i got to be honest with you. It's powerful to say there's a curse on people that trust in the flesh of man. Now, the word flesh has a meaning not just like the skin or your meat. No, the flesh is the, the man without God. The man who has a fallen sin nature. Adam, after he sinned, 
This is called the flesh. The, the, the man that is trusting in himself, yeah, all that he has, very talented and skilled people, like a, a, whatever you want to call it, any category, I guarantee you there is a curse there. Miss America, whoever that person is, wow, she is, but no. If her trust is in that, there's a curse there. You say, come on, there's a curse? Yeah. Follow the narrative. Follow the biography. That beauty decays. That money may disappear or may multiply and bring a tremendous pain into your personal life. Tremendous jealousy, envy, covetousness, emptiness, loneliness. Hollywood is full of it. But you don't have to go there. You can just go right here in your own heart. Cursed is the man that is trusting in himself. Okay, go to verse 6 now. For he shall be like the heath in the desert. And that is where we came from. The heat is unbelievable in the summer in Oman. There are oases in the country. It's actually very beautiful in many ways, but it's also hot. And yet, um, is you know, uh, you see plants, very shrubs that just live in the heat. And they, will, they are there, and here it, it describes a man that is trusting in his flesh as a heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes. Here comes the good, but I can't see it. It's hard to see it sometimes, to be honest with you. I remember hearing about a medical doctor who had his profession here in Baltimore, and at the end of it, at the, when his children were grown up and had gone off to school, and he didn't know them, and he said, I, I raised my family, but I was always busy, always at the hospital. I never got to know them, and now it's almost like too late. They're gone. And sometimes when our children are right in on our knees and at our elbows, we may not see how good it is. I might not see good when it comes. Even in my church, I might not recognize how good it is. When I live in India, I may not realize how good it is. When I live in Oman, I may not realize how good it is. What it is, what God is doing. Because Paul said that we would comprehend the dimensions of his love that passes knowledge. A certain kind of knowledge. We'll look at that in a second. Look at verse 6. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. That's why people turn to sublimation. They are, they are, um, they are inhabiting parched places. It's never enough. I always need another dollar, another job to make a little more money, to get a little more, get more. It's never enough. I'm always a little bit late, a little bit early. Never have the opportunity. When the opportunity comes, it's gone. I missed it. I never see the good when it comes. My life is filled with goodness, but I don't get it. I'm always complaining about something. Oh, my, my children are never behaving right. Uh, things are never working out for me. My wife is never satisfying me. I'm, there's always something missing. I'm inhabiting parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land, not inhabited alone. What's the basis of Pastor Carl and Susie's life? What's the difference between one person and another. What happens? How do we reach people in the world? Whether they are a camel herder in the Middle East or a 
roulette, roulette, as a roulette, roulette player in Las Vegas. What's the difference? Here it is. Here's the difference. Verse 7. Blessed is the man. That, there it is. That trusteth in the Lord. And whose hope the Lord is. What do you hope? The Lord is my hope. Now follow this. In the flesh, this is what people hope for. The lottery. That's it. That's what I need. I win the lottery. There we go. All my problems are taken care of. There it is. That's what I need. And the Bible says no. Your hope, if your hope is the Lord, then you are blessed. I don't know if you understand me. It is so amazingly true. I cannot believe it in my own life. I'm sitting at a table across from my 33-year-old son who has some depth in his life and a faith in his life, just like many in this ministry. I'm sitting there amazed. God, how did you do this? How could it be that my children are believers also? And not only believers, but they believe this. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Thank you, Lord, I didn't teach them that the key to life is education. The key to life is money. The key to life is camels or horses. The key to life is not a people, the woman or the man or the people, the friends. The key to life is not the systems or the programs. The key to life is the Lord. The Lord. That's what Paul said, that we would comprehend the breadth and length of this amazing love that passes the knowledge of this world. The world doesn't get it. They always run from one lottery ticket to another. And they're like, you know, like so much, like so much believing in that. I could care less. I could care less. I have no interest in it. I have found Christ. And the same man who walked out of that hospital with a brain tumor dissolved, who is sitting in our convention, and the doctor said you had, he, he had eight days to live. He had eight days to live. And now he heads up a ministry in the largest tuberculosis hospital in, in the world and could care less about dying because he has found love that passes knowledge. And that man is blessed. He is like, how could a poor Indian man with nothing, not even, even any friends visiting him at the end of his life, a young man, how could a poor Indian man alone dying be a blessed man because God said, if you trust in me and you make me your hope, and I don't even think he did at that point in his life, was the team that did it. God prayed, God healed him in any case, and now he is on the move. He's blessed. Verse 7. Let's read it. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. That's what you have to teach your children. That's like the football team yesterday and the championship game and Pat Lynch, the most amazing coach in the history of the human race. <laughs> and, and this school and these teachers and uh, investing and the kids learning apologetics, but more relationship, but more body life, but more their moms and dads are in the faith, but more, you never know how it works, it's a mystery because nobody knows how the heart goes. But here it is in verse 8. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out her roots by the river. And now shall not see when heat comes. There's a tree. I heard about a tree in 
Las Vegas or Nevada somewhere. And it's a big oak tree, but it's in the desert. But underneath it is the, is the underground uh, aquifer, the underground river that the tree lives off of. By sight, you say the tree would never make it. But understanding what is underneath the tree, you realize it. Same with us. Maybe one day we will face a challenge. Maybe there will be a cancer, like some of you have faced. Maybe a broken heart, like many have faced. Maybe, maybe a financial crisis, like many have to go through in their lives. All of these happen to people at different times. Hopefully not at all. But if a man has a total trust in the Lord... He will be like a tree planted by the rivers. And he will not see when the heat comes. The other man is cursed. He cannot see when the good comes. But this tree, he does not see when the heat comes. And he sees when the good is there. He sees it. He realizes it. Like Pastor Carl he is sitting in his home. I got a cold there. And for some strange, I think it was the air conditioning. And anyway, he goes, are you okay? I'm thinking, you are asking me? You are asking me if I am okay? Like, shame on me? That I would have any kind of any, he didn't mean it this way, but I'm thinking like self-pity, you know, feel sorry for me, and you know how human nature can be. But then when we are putting our trust in Christ and learning to live with him, and this does cost a price to follow Christ. It costs you something. Calculate the cost. Pay the price, whatever it may be. Put your trust in him. Forsake your sin and selfishness, and put your trust in him and become a worshiper of God. This is where our new dimensions come in, where we're able to care about others. We're able to care about other people. We're able to go into places where others don't go. We're able to pray and believe. We're able to give forgiveness. We're able to love. We're able to be investors. Okay, verse Eight, we'll finish up. It says, Our roots are spread out by the river. Where are your roots spread out? But by the river of God. We'll not see when he comes, but her leaf shall be green. <coughs> shall not be careful in the year of drought. Not be careful in the year of drought. Not be careful when things are drying up. It's drying up. Let's go anyway. Um, nobody else is going. It doesn't matter. We're going anyway. It's drying up. Our opportunities are shut down. We can make new opportunities. God is with us. Psalm 62.5. God is our expectation. Well, how do we make those calculations? We, we hear from God, or we have faith, or we, love motivates us. We can do things that others are calculating, counting their, their bean, the bean counter. They're counting and very careful not to lose. But this man that is trusting in the Lord he is not making those careful calculations. He is able to be... Uh, um, not be careful in the year of drought. Not make those calculations, but live in faith. We can go, because love says so. Remember when Mary went to the tomb, when Jesus had died, been buried, in the, on the first day of the week she went to the tomb, and on her way she thought, with the other lady there, who will roll away the stone? I think if it was a couple of engineers on the way, they would have stopped. We didn't make that calculation. Nobody will remove away. There will be nobody there this time in the morning. Uh, we'll have to do. Let's go back home and catch a little more sleep. 
and think it over. How will the stone be rolled away? They went anyway. Go anyway. Go anyway. Love passes knowledge. Love is able to live beyond. Love is able to believe. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not losing hope in those d difficult times. Love is waiting upon God. L love is believing. Blessed is that man that is believing and trusting. And then and lastly, verse 8, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. He's fruitful. I cannot explain to you what I saw in Pastor Carl's life when I was with him this week. I cannot tell you what I saw. I was in tears often. I was amazed. I saw in his eyes spirit of joy, spirit of light. I saw in his face and his countenance. I saw in his wife an angel. I cannot believe her. She's amazing. I, I, I was in a room of, of faith, a room of the Holy Spirit that uh, passes knowledge. I thought, this is Christ in our presence. I, I cannot believe what I saw in the convention there. Uh, with all the, these various Indian young guys that have vision for their country, and they go to some very s serious Hindu communities and areas of India, and they are not afraid. They hardly have, they have very little money, they don't care about it. They have money to live upon, and they're just loving to reach people with the gospel. This could not happen if it was verse 5 and 6 of this text. Cursed is a man that trusts in his flesh. Cursed is that man that is making those calculations that everybody in the world is making all the time every day. Cursed, he's under, he's under a limited, he's on a leash. He's limited by his humanity and by everything that people say about life. And when Christ came into this world, he came to bring us a blessing. And he said, trust in me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I will do things for you, I will bless you, you will be like a tree planted by the water, you will not see when the heat comes, and you will bear fruit, you will not cease from yielding fruit, even in your old age. The tree will keep on pumping out, keep on producing the spirit of love and joy, and peace and ministry. Well, I've seen that in our church here for decades, and I thank God for that. I think this is the thing where we must always check ourselves. What is the basis of our worldwide ministry is trusting in the Lord. What is the basis of our personal lives and our family lives? It is making the Lord our trust. What is the basis of our children's life? It is to teach them to trust in God. God is real. God will make himself known to us. But beware, in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. I don't know, some days I'm living in verse 5 and 6. Other days I'm living in verses 7 and 8. Some days my heart is trusting in my flesh. I can get this done. I know how to do this. I've done it before. I'm able. I know how this works. And I'm trusting in my flesh. Other days I am not. I'm putting all my trust in God. And yet I'm doing my duty or I'm doing my thing, but I am putting my trust in Christ. Putting my trust in Christ in every area. Putting my trust in Him in every way and in every area. Okay? Wow, that's amazing. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you this morning for what we have seen these 12 days. We thank you what we have seen in actually 10 years 
20 years it may be for many, we have seen God's blessing. It takes a spiritual eye to see God's goodness all around us every day. It takes a spiritual eye to discern God's presence and God's work in this world. He has hid it from the proud. He has hid it from those that trust the flesh. That man is crying every day about the curse that they, they find life is cursed. And they don't get it. They can't find it. Blessed is the humble man that is saying, God, I need you. I need you. I trust you. I need you. This world is not enough for me. I turn away from myself and this world and I put my trust in you. A living God. It's amazing that God would care about us like this. It is amazing that God would speak to us and tell us. It's amazing that we could hear him and believe him and trust in him. Do that today in your heart. Say to Christ, I trust you. Show me this blessing. Beyond the blessings of men, I want the blessing of God. Beyond the ways of men, I want the way of God. Beyond people, I want God's way, God's mind. Lord, thank you for what we saw in India. Thank you for what we heard and saw in Oman. And bless our congregation here in every home, every family, all that we do. And we put our trust in you. If you're here today and putting your trust in Jesus for the first time, raise your hand, please. If you're saying to Christ, I trust in you, would you put your hand up, please? Anyone at all this morning? Yes to Jesus, anyone? Yes to Jesus, I put my trust in Jesus Christ. Wow, anyone, anyone at all? Yes to Jesus, yes to the Lord. Anyone at all? Yes, Lord. That's amazing. We are your people. When I see people without their hands up, I marvel and I thank you, God, that we are your children. I thank you that we are saved, every one of us, by grace, and we will be in heaven forever and understanding the ways of God forever.